welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for being here today with me, being here today with us. My name is Alexander Boudijn. I'm a researcher at Greenhouse Technology at Wageningen University and Research. And today I'd like to share with you our thoughts on circular greenhouse horticulture. Uh, we're also very curious to hear your ideas and we're looking forward to a lively discussion afterwards. But first, let me start with a brief overview of why we're looking at greenhouse horticulture. Why are we looking at greenhouses? Well, as a part of agriculture, greenhouse horticulture faces a big challenge. Um, how are we going to produce enough healthy food for everyone, everywhere, without having a negative impact on the environment? How are we going to face the global food challenge without contributing to climate change, eutrophication, and resource depletion? Now, to do that, we have to make a shift towards more sustainable agricultural systems. And the sustainable development goals set by the United Nations can be a guideline in that transition. Uh, we also see these goals as a call to action for greenhouse horticulture to keep improving, to be part of that transition. And in a report uh, recently brought out by Top Sector Horticulture, uh, there were especially three goals where greenhouse horticulture can have a big impact. Zero hunger, decent work and economic growth, and responsible consumption and production. If you look at greenhouses versus open field cultivation, it can tremendously increase productivity. That's because greenhouses offer a controlled environment. In terms of the climate, you have more control over air temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, lighting, but also by taking the crop out of the soil and putting it on a substrate, you have more control over water and nutrient balances. You can optimize it. So this greatly increases yield per square meter, but also extends often growing seasons of a product. In terms of nutrition, greenhouses can contribute to uh, diversifying local diets by expanding the availability of fresh fruits and vegetables. And greenhouse design is also adaptable to local climate conditions, which makes it very employable in many parts of the world which is especially interesting if there are areas where open field cultivation is less of an option, is limited. Our knowledge within the Netherlands on greenhouse technology, on crop management, also proves to be a very interesting export product um, because it can stimulate the economic growth and development abroad while also expanding Dutch exports. And we see here a photo of the Jordan Valley. This is a project we, we are uh, involved with. And the idea of the project was to increase food security and employment opportunities for Syrian refugees and Jordanians, uh, while also giving Dutch companies the opportunity to expand their business in the Middle East in Jordan. Greenhouse horticulture also proves to be very resource efficient, especially when it comes to water, nutrients, arable land, which can be very scarce or limited available in some places. For instance, if you look at an open field tomato cultivation, it can take up to 60 liters per kilogram produced tomato. While if you're looking at a greenhouse with a substrate, drip irrigation, and recirculation of drain, uh, you only need about 10 to 15 liters per kilogram produced. So that's quite a difference. So in short, greenhouses are tools that are very interesting to use for sustainable food production. But we're not completely there yet. There are not all aspects about greenhouse horticulture are fully sustainable or indeed circular. So to get to those sustainability goals, we need to make a transition from a mentality of take, make, waste, a linear economy, to a more circular economy. An economy where we keep reusing our precious resources. And you've probably heard this before, and this transition is already going on. We're somewhere in the middle, where actually we are already reusing a lot of our resources, but we still need the input of raw materials and we're still producing residual waste. So the question is, how are we going to get to a fully circular economy? And what does that mean within this topic for greenhouse horticulture? We see greenhouse horticulture, a circular greenhouse horticulture, as efficient, clean, and connected. And what I mean by that is that the incoming flows, they don't come from natural reserves. They don't contribute to resource depletion. So we're looking towards other sources for instance, other production and processing systems, or as a part of the natural cycle. As an output, if your resources enter your company, they should only come out as part of your product, 
as resource for another production process or again as part of the natural cycle. What do I mean by that? So if we look for instance as resources that are part of your product, that product should be designed in a way that enables it to remain within the circular economy even after consumers have used it. If resources leave the greenhouse for another production process, they have to be of sufficient quality. Let's take a look at, for instance, plant material or tomato stems that we want to use for packaging material, to recreate them into packaging material. To do that, we have to ensure from the greenhouse horticultural side, we have to review what we can do to ensure that that plant material flow is of sufficient quality so the manufacturer of the packaging can still use it or the processing company that's in between. And we see this line of reasoning on three levels. We see it on the company level. Within the company, we want to be efficient with resources and recirculate within the company as much as possible. We see it for the horticultural sector. If you want to exchange or combine material flows between companies, they have to be clean or of sufficient quality. And we also see it between greenhouse, horticulture and other sectors because there's also a lot of crossover projects that you can think about. For instance, with animal husbandry exchanging flows or aquaculture or the chemical industry, urban processes. And what we want to do with our research in the coming years is to facilitate that transition. We want to develop a, a practical approach so we can identify what are the biggest challenges of closing a loop, why are we not clo closing it at the moment. And when we know where those bottlenecks are, we want to start a redesign process to redesign greenhouse production systems. And we don't want to do this alone, but we also want to do it with other sectors to explore crossover projects. I'll get to that as well. And finally, what we learn, we want to implement together with public and private parties to generate new business cases, to get it into practice. And this year, 2019, we've already started with those activities. And one of the results or part of the results that are coming out of our approach to look at the greatest challenges, to identify those challenges, is with material flow analyses. So for these 10 major ingoing and outgoing flows of greenhouse horticulture, we're going to look at them in a more quantitative and a qualitative way. And hopefully we can identify challenges and starting points to start new projects and see where we can improve. This is an example of what our data looks like after we've gathered it and analyzed it. This is a Sankey diagram of the net flows of a Dutch tomato greenhouse production. Water and minerals we're looking at. And the size of the flows is determined by the quantity. So this is a more quantitative analysis. And what we see is that rainwater, for instance, is obviously the primary source of irrigation. And then the water that goes into the greenhouse is mostly evaporated by the plant. Some of it ends up in the fruits, in the product, and only a fraction goes towards discharge and leakage. If we look at minerals, on the input side, we see the approximate ratios that you need uh, in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium that go into the greenhouse. And on the output side, we see that most of these nutrients end up in the fruits, in the product itself. That's what we want. Some of it is used by the plant to create stems and leaves. And a fraction, again, goes into the environment together with the discharge water. What can we take from an analysis like this? So we see, for instance, if you want to save on water use, evaporation is to flow to look at. But plants do have to evaporate. So there's already been a design, a closed greenhouse concept, to capture that water that's present in moist air, leaving the greenhouse through the windows when ventilation is going on, to go to a more closed greenhouse design to keep that water inside, condensate it, and keep reusing it. But this is just numbers. If we look more towards the story or the estimated impact of flows, we get a different picture. On the output side, we see, for instance, that evaporation, estimated impact, is part of the natural cycle. Plants evaporate that rainwater back into the natural cycle, doesn't have a big effect on the environment. However, discharge water, containing nutrients, that can have a big impact on the environment. Uh, for instance, a negative impact on the natural water, water quality and the biodiversity. 
So even though the discharge flow in the quantitative analysis was rather small, it can still have a rather large, large impact. If we look towards circular, we go to the inputs and we see that phosphorus and potassium are larger, are larger flows. And these nutrients, they are mined from mines which are actually natural reserves. And these reserves will run out at a certain point if we keep on going like this. We need to look towards a way of finding other sources, for instance like urban sewage, as a source to mine these minerals from. Together with a quantitative and more estimated impact analysis, we have starting points to start new projects and new ways of thinking on how to solve those production systems. We start a process of redesign. Redesign within the company itself, but sometimes it may prove more efficient that problems are solved on a more regional level. So this is a, an example. This is the project Aqua Reuse, where a cluster of greenhouses send their wastewater to be purified, and the same companies get that water back for irrigation. This is an example of closing the cycle on a more regional level. And third, like I mentioned before, we're also looking at crossovers. One of the crossovers we're going to look more in depth at is aquaponics. And this is an example of what the combination of a greenhouse and a recirculating aquaculture system could look like if you want to exchange water, nutrients, carbon dioxide, energy. And in analyzing and redesigning production systems, we, put, we try to put the emphasis on closing cycles that have a big impact. So the starting points from the material flow analysis I just showed you. And you can see that, for instance, the input of potassium and phosphorus are also here with exclamation marks because they are one of the cycles that it's very important to close. This is another example of one of the cases we will look at. Um, we will actually reconsider it because this is an idea that was already there eight years ago. But then the concept of combining greenhouses, pig farms and open field cultivation was not yet very much in line with the agenda. The circular economy was not that high on the agenda back then. But now we can reevaluate this case with the new, under new circumstances, with new knowledge and new technologies. Our aim is also in getting these crossovers and getting more fundamental knowledge. In the end, we want to start also demo farms to see if we can validate and get those concepts into practice. In short, we see the sustainable development goals and the circular economy as a call to action for greenhouse horticulture to keep improving, to be part of the transition, to contribute. We see circular greenhouse horticulture as efficient, clean and connected. And connected for us today doesn't only apply to material flows or technologies, it's always also about people. So our message today is as well that we want to connect with you, with partners in the public and commercial sector, so we can make the transition towards a circular economy a success. Thank you.